Right. Hello, everyone. I think we are ready to get started. So contrary to the name on my video, my name is Victoria Friedman, and I am the director of the Symposium of Rising Scholars at Polygens. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker today, Professor Chong Rei Li. Professor Li is the Ward W. and Priscilla B. Ward's Professor of English at Stanford University and was previously the Director of Creative Writing at Princeton University. His work, which may be familiar to you, explores issues central to the Asian American experience. He has written six novels, Native Speaker, A Gesture Life, Aloft, The Surrendered, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, On Such a Full Sea, which was a finalist for the NBCC and won the Heartland Fiction Prize, and his most recent novel, My Year Abroad. I personally took a copy of My Year Abroad while on my honeymoon last summer and would consider it a must read. His work has won numerous awards and citations, including the Hemingway Foundation slash Penn Award, the American Book Award, the Anisfield Wolf Literary Award, the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. In 2021, he was recognized for a lifetime achievement in the novel with an award of merit from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, as well as elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are so delighted to have Professor Lee with us today to talk about the process of writing his first first novel and the lessons he learned along the way. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lee, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, it's uh, it's and thank you for taking my book along on your honeymoon. I'm I'm very honored. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for logging on. Uh, it's my pleasure to to be here today and to talk uh, to talk to you about my first novel. Since um, most of you are all in high school, I thought I'd say a few words about the beginnings of my writing life. Um, ever since publishing my first novel, Native Speaker, this, I guess, almost 30 years ago, I've often been asked how it was that I became a writer uh, at bookstore and library readings, at literary festivals and formal interviews, uh, sometimes even in my own classroom here at Stanford. People are naturally curious as to when I began writing and why. Of course, it's a long and inexact answer uh, with a lot of parts. I know that when I consider the question, I realize that a good deal of my answers have to do with my high school years, a time when I began to understand and accept some realities about myself. What were those realities, you ask? Well, namely that I was not going to be the world-class athlete I assumed I would be when I was 11 years old, when I was the biggest, fastest kid in the class. I guess I just wasn't early mature physically, although I just stopped growing. Um, the other was that in, in, a, in you know, against uh, my, uh, in my cultural and, and genetic hubris, the, re the reality that I wasn't terribly good at math and science, um, which given my Asian heritage, everyone assumed I would be or should be, including my parents. And finally, that along with all the other things I was interested in, I had an especially intense ardor for reading. I had always read a lot of books and loved them, but too often during middle school and the one year of local high school I attended, the poems and novels and short stories we read, unfortunately, were treated more like fodder for trivia and memory practice than as works of art. Although I hope not, Maybe some of you are familiar with this kind of teaching approach. There were fill-in and multiple choice questions to test whether we had actually read the material and could remember what happened, or simply identify certain characters or place names, such as who was Mercutio or what came to Burnham Wood. As we encountered it, literature was like anything else to be studied, something factual, something patent, something definitely static. It was only when I took a seat in my first English class at prep school where I boarded did it come alive for me in the same ways I felt when I was curled up with a book in my hands back at my parents' house, 
being transported by the private, untold histories of other consciousnesses and worlds. During that first year at school as a sophomore, the whole school was reading the works of the novelist James Agee, who was an alumnus. We read his books, uh, A Death in the Family and Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Both are amazing works, of course, but it was Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, a dense novelistic portrait of depression era subsistence farmers accompanied with photographs by Walker Evans that made a lasting impression on me. A.G. Docu documents the plight of these folks. Uh, they're hard and brief and often brutal lives, but it isn't only the stories that I found so moving, but the language he summons to tell them. There are long sections devoted entirely to such things as the contents of a one-room shack, the tender glow of a lamp, the hardened creases in a young woman's face, virtuous descriptions of the things themselves, but also of their being, their luminous whatness. And for the first time, I thought that here was language not simply recording or presenting the world or experience, but was itself a wondrous creation, awesome and true. And then as well, my private rapture was one public and shared. For while I was fairly quiet in class, my new classmates had no trouble articulating their appraisals of the book's poetic structures and its meditations on justice and morality and the nature of existence. Now, not all of what was said by my classmates made perfect sense or was even decipherable, but what was always clear was the feeling that this literature mattered, that our exercise wasn't merely academic, that our considerations could go on outside of the classroom maybe even become part of our daily living. Later that year, the legendary Argentine writer, uh, the masterful Jorge Luis Borges, if some of you know his work, came to the school as a special speaker. This was a few years before his death, and he moved very slowly, being infirm and blind. But when he recited his poetry, a sudden vitality seemed to spark in him, a youthful delight and joyousness. The language was his salve, his elixir. For a moment, I was sure he could see. After the reading, I shook his frail hand and he greeted me and everyone else with genuine warmth. Soon after that, I began writing poems, the first time I'd ever written creatively. I have to say that I wrote very earnest, very heartfelt and deep verse about such things as the autonomy of lawnmowers and pie eating and although my poems were thoroughly silly and pretty awful, actually, um, they're really terribly awful, no one discouraged or belittled my efforts. In fact, just the opposite happened. My teachers seemed to go out of their way to encourage me, sensing perhaps the keenness of my interest, if not any discernible talent. In my English classes, there was always an opportunity to write stories, and even an advanced creative writing class for seniors admission to which was by application only. I was quite proud to get a spot in the class, which was full of us terribly serious and brilliant and very soon to be great American novelists, all of us preening and strutting for each other and the teacher. Perhaps some of you are taking a writing class like this now. Anyway, I can still see my classmates around that table. There was Lily, a most prim and proper Bostonian, who wrote about debutantes in extreme psychic distress. There was groovy Charles, whose bizarre stories of vision quests and apocalypse always blew us away. There was the somber and secretive Ned, who had so much artistic integrity, he never once showed us anything he'd written. And then, in fact, there was a truly gifted fellow named Brooks Hansen. He was one of my best friends and wrote prose like an angel and is now the author of of uh, several brilliant, fabulous novels, including The Chess Garden and Pearlman's Ordeal. I was there too, pretty quiet for sure, writing super emotional, deeply sentimental stories about an angsty kid desperately trying to figure out the usual things. First love, homesickness, who in the world he was and might someday be. My inspirations were the James Joyce short stories, Araby and the Dead, and even now, I will reread his collection every year or so and other writers' works I read 
from that time to remind myself of what first jazzed me about writing. Maybe because I've been writing for, for a living so long, I sometimes forget what it is I do. And this is true. So I'll pick up my old copy of Dubliners or Leaves of Grass or On the Road and start reading. And I'm transported in time and place by this tattered, humble conveyance, reminding me of something Borges once wrote. He said, and I quote, a book is a thing among things, a volume lost among the volumes that populate the indifferent universe until it meets its reader, the person destined for its symbols. What then occurs is that singular emotion called beauty, that lovely mystery which neither psychology nor criticism can describe. That lovely mystery. That's what I feel now whenever I encounter exceptional prose or verse, and that transports me right back to my old classroom or on a bench on that campus. I was encountering beauty, beauty not just with a big B, but also my own private vision of it, a form of what others no doubt find in an elegant set of equations or in a house design or software code. Now, it would be nice to report that from that moment on, I understood the nature of my aesthetic philosophy and connected with my unconscious and that my writing career developed steadily and inexorably, uh, but that was nothing like the truth. I didn't very, write very much in college, in fact. I didn't even take a creative writing class. And after graduating, I took a job on Wall Street, the more out of a sense of duty to my parents than any interest in finance, which I ended up quitting that job to try to write a novel, which was not, in fact, my first published novel, Native Speaker. I thought I'd say a few words to you this morning about the writing of that first, first novel, the unpublished one which, along with many other handicaps, had the burden of shouldering the very peculiar and unpromising title of Agnew Belittlehead. Agnew Belittlehead, I was quite certain, was going to be my ticket to everlasting literary glory and fame. It was a pain to two of my contemporary literary heroes, Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo, a trailblazing novel of ideas, philosophically deep, pop culturally savvy, obsessively referential, and infinitely clever. The story dealt with the hero Agnew's discovery of a growing underground cult of downtown New Yorkers who are disseminating through organic food co-ops a tasty psychotropic wild mushroom that, once consumed, would play the same certain cult-defied message in every eater's mind, much like any cable broadcast. The novel, naturally, was challengingly multiform, telling its cautionary tale of media dominance over a synaptically overstimulated populace via various modal strategy, strategies, including stream of consciousness, verse sections set in heroic couplets, a complete three act play within a play, discursive monologues on the nature of being and perception, as well as cursory shadings of run of the mill descriptive prose and dialogue as well as some basic characterization, though not too much. No surprise that it became a very big novel, over 600 dense pages. And when I finished it and printed it out after a marathon two week straight writing session, I fell into bed and slept from what must have been 30 hours as if in a fever. I remember dreaming of swimming at the sandy bottom of a dark sea or more scuttling in the shadows like a crab but then finally springing upwards, if fitfully, towards a glimmering at the surface, no doubt the bright Klieg lights of a well-deserved recognition. When I awoke, the first thing I saw was the high stack of manuscript pages on my desk and felt at once an electric surge of pride for the accomplishment. But after a while, the good hunt faded and I was replaced and it was replaced by a secret dread that I'd been keeping at bay for the previous two years of working on it, the dread having to do with what I knew was not to be found in the novel. What was that lack? At the time, I'm sure I couldn't say. Those first years of my writing life in New York City were a kind of ecstasy, half painful as ecstasies are, as I'd set myself to write constantly, figuring 
that having quit that Wall Street job where I was working 12 hours a day, I could and should give at least eight to 10 hours daily to writing and often more. I'd practically lash myself to my chair and like a long distance oarsman, pull through the chop with a steady rhythm of verbiage, a rhythm that itself became the focus of the day. I'd half hum along to the clicks of my keyboard, doing whatever I could to keep the cadence steady and regular. More than anything else, I dreaded the pauses, fearing that they'd extend into silences I might not be able to break. And so sometimes I'd literally just type out words and even gibberish, simply to keep hearing the sound of the keys, like some stenographic Scheherazade. Or else I'd pull the sh off the shelf a novel I admired and start typing that out, desperate to see language appear on the screen. I do this with Delillo's The Names and Pynchon's The Cry Crying of Lot 49, a lot of other books. And then also, out of curiosity, uh, with those uh, books I didn't think much of, to see if they read any better posing as words of mine. Not surprisingly, they did. Later, of course, I'd go back and cut the borrowed prose and overlay the deletion with my resumed narrative, half hoping that there would be a residual brilliance imparted by the ghosts of those words that would somehow embolden and vivify my own. This typifying the kind of desperate wish I entertained, that there could be a virtue found in some imagined electronic palimpsest. In this way, I pile the words up by the hundreds and sometimes thousands. Words that for reasons of both inexperience and denial, I had great difficulty evaluating, but that I could at least use as a kind of ballast. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I needed that ballast. Along with the usual burdens of first time novel writing, very little know-how, even less confidence, no prospects whatsoever. I was also stuck in the reality of my mother's terminal cancer, a mire of pre-mourning that too many of us know is a terrible mixture of sadness and anger, of fear and guilt and utter confusion, and of especially the numbness that arises in the wake of feeling too intensely for too long. Some of you may have read my personal essays about my mother, and so I won't say too much else, except to say that up to that time, she was the center of my family's life and mine as well. I knew that, that even then, as a 25-year-old, self-styled urban literary artiste, I knew I was losing the core of much of everything I had known, perhaps all of what was important. One would think that something of that somber awareness would have found its way into Agnew Belittlehead, a midnight hue of loss, a seam of the tragic. But the funny thing about the book, which I began to see immediately as I read it through for the very first time on waking from that final blaze of writing-induced slumber, was how purely intellectualized it was, and almost aggressively so. I can't offer any passages from that work as it's now housed in the coded purgatory of a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, all hard copies long destroyed. But think of a hybrid of Gravity's Rainbow and Mao Tu with unhealthy doses of Huxley's The Doors of Perception and Castaneda's A Separate Reality. And what you'd have was my minor monster of a book, a bombastic, unfunny, oddly new agey version of a David Foster Wallace toss off that seemed even to its half delirious author, a chilly, unlovable creature. Needless to say, I completely ignored these feelings, strapped up the beast with extra large rubber bands and dropped it off to an editor acquaintance of mine at a major publishing house who would, we'd agreed, take a very casual look at the material in order to give me initial impressions and suggestions. Though of course, we both knew this was a purely pro forma prelude to the gushing six figure two book offer she'd call back with a day or in, in a day or two, or perhaps even late that night from her midtown office, unable as she would be to cease reading and leave. But the phone didn't ring that evening, nor even after I returned in the wee hours of the morning 
after celebrating the book's completion with friends. And I still hadn't heard a word from her when I departed a couple weeks later for what would turn out to be the last extended stay at my parents' house while my mother was alive. My usual month-long visit lasting nearly a year and encompassing her final difficult weeks, her death and funeral, my sister and sister's and father's eventual return to their jobs, as well as my recognition, merely confirmed by a gentle, generous, clearly incontrovertible letter of rejection from that very editor, that my novel, though energetic and promising in parts, was not publishable. The problem, as I remember her and a few other readers generally saying, was that there was very little of me in the writing. They didn't mean autobiographical material exactly, though that might have helped. Simply put, there didn't seem to be things in the work that were vital and important to me. There was certainly plenty of what I thought and presumed was important and vital to some abstracted literary reader. Challenging notions and dazzling world word plays, a Byzantine narrative structure worthy of endless future study by astonished scholars, plenty of cool quotient cultural references and inside jokes. I took these criticisms, but didn't really believe them. Instead, I kept daubing at the book, not cutting or revising, but adding layers and more layers, picturing fame, but in fact, courting failure with each added paragraph, each added page. Then one day in the spring of 1991, I received a letter saying that I'd been accepted with a fellowship into the MFA creative writing program at Oregon. My application submission had been half a chapter of Agnew Belittlehead. A full chapter, I should note, was way past the word limit. I was alone in my mother's house, no one to share the good news with, and decided to read through the book one more time, momentarily revived by the idea that indeed there was something literally acceptable in the novel something I could return to and build on, no matter what anyone, including myself, had previously believed. I made a cup of fresh coffee and stepped into the screen porch, prepared to be rejuvenated, re-inspired. But I couldn't get further than a few pages, the familiar obscuring, obscuring thickets stifling all progress. And I finally understood what I'd been doing for the past two years that I'd been writing toward the idea of what a literary book should be, and by extension, the posture and character of its writer. I understood, and in the most profound sense, that the effort had been a departure as well, a densely concealed escape, sentence by sentence, from the heartbreak and confusion and despondency that had been my family's life. I resolved then that I would, I would file the book away for good, and that when I landed at the writing program that autumn, I would begin again to try the second time to write my first novel. It was an utterly diminishing moment, this plain admission and an acceptance of failure. And yet, I must say that I felt the small but intense shock of a revival too. I was completely surprised at my own conviction. For while I had no better prospects for success, I still desired to keep writing, to keep working. It was like looking up at the sheer unforgiving face of a thousand foot rock, having no equipment or tools or special shoes, and knowing, despite the signs, that you would soon begin searching anyway, for whatever tenuous foothold, for whatever breach or fissure into which you might slip your fingers, and so tempt yet another ascent. I did have another story in mind, something I've been thinking about for a year or two, and perhaps much longer than that. A story that I've been marking and noting, but also keeping a safe distance from. It was the narrative of a young man whose identity was in question, a mystery not of fact, but of character. An exploration, to paraphrase Margaret Atwood, not of the what and the where and the when, but of the who and the why. The messy stuff of being human but now recast to be particular, singular, so that the young man was not merely a nebulous observer, as in Agnew Belittlehead, of bizarre doings in downtown New York, 
but a deeply conflicted and unsettled correspondent, perhaps the son of an immigrant, whose investigations of the culture would lead eventually back to himself. And while I was certain that very few outward details of my own life would find their way into the narrative, I would finally invite what the poet Garrett Hongo calls those long notes of trouble to inform the work, which in my case were considerations of immigrant life and assimilation and fractured identity, private anthems that had stirred me always and that I so assiduously muted. Again, I would like to report that all fell into place after that, that I settled in graduate school in Eugene, Oregon, and wrote wisely and gloriously. But once begun, my new novel, though more compelling than the previous attempt, more focused thematically, still seemed oddly disengaged to me. The writing, in truth, was not much more honest or emotionally real than the interminable psychedelic riffs of Agnew Belittlehead, despite my very conscious intentions otherwise. I wanted to move my readers, not just impress them. And yet there was a vitality missing, <coughs> excuse me, that betrayed a fundamental problem, not specific issues of execution or craft, so much as my inspiration for writing fiction, why I was even bothering. I suppose that's why I would like to use the word faith in talking about writing this first novel. Because despite thinking that all of my efforts up to that time, all of my education at a good boarding school and good college, all of my serious reading, all the stories I'd earnestly written since adolescence would be sufficient goods for me to sit down at a desk and with cerebral emotional focus and force of will write a worthy novel. They definitely were not. By faith, of course, I don't mean the belief of the writer in some literary destiny or some wild-eyed insistence on his own talent, but rather an unshakable and obsessive allegiance to storytelling, a passion which can sustain the long-running wonderment and self-quarrel that any serious novel requires from its writer. I believe the form of this passion is different for every writer. It's a kind of captivation you at once welcome and suffer through. What draws you to writing stories and holds you beyond any ability to reason or do anything else. For one writer, it might be the inciting situation, a tragic occurrence that begs a narrative. For another, it might be a character, a figure so compelling that his or her presence recasts the world, a Holden Caulfield, an Emma Bovary, or a pressing social reality as in novels by Emile Zola or Steinbeck. Or perhaps with most of us, it's an abstraction we are desperate to articulate, a long lingering emotion, a memory, a coloration, even a trope. For me, that faith is a faith in language. I can't say that I could have expressed this back then, but I think that's what I began to feel and understand. For something shifted inside me, for suddenly I knew I would write the same basic story, but write it differently, with neither abandon nor too much rigor, but with a strangely familiar attention to the words, the same attention that naturally clicked in when I read the stories and poems I loved which was, above all, an attention for their language. Only now I was writing toward that feeling, but within the parameters of my own fictive world, writing into the void and hoping for the same. I began to write a chapter I'd been long skirting, a scene concerning the death of the protagonist's young son. And I thought I'd like to read a short excerpt, excerpt of it now. Just to give you background, Henry Park, the narrator, recounts what he sees as he arrives at his father's house, where he and his wife, Lelia, are throwing a birthday party for their son named Mitt. Mitt has just been pulled out from beneath the playful dog pile of his friends, but he's unconscious and blue in the face. <clears throat> Here's the prose. I bent down and started blowing in Mitt's mouth. Lelia cried that she tried already. She kept screaming about it, and I had to tell her to shut up. I didn't know what I was doing. 
I pulled open his mouth and blew anyway, a dozen times, a hundred, pumping down on his chest with all my weight, eventually pounding on him as if he were solid ground. I shudder to think that I might have injured him, hurt his delicate breastbone or his ribs, or worse, that his last thought was to ask why his father was harming him. I've read the dying feel no pain, but sense everything that goes on around them. They view the scene from a brief distance above, and no matter who they are or how old, they gain a wisdom from that last vista. But we are the living, remaining on the ground, and what we know is the narrow and the broken. Here, we are strewn about in the lengthy expanse of an arch archipelago, too far to call one another, too far to see. Mornings brought sober hope, then the usual imperatives. Look for Lelia. She was most often gone before I woke, already somewhere off in the city working with students. Now keep thinking. Think for keeps. Then isolate the wonderments, the curiosities of his death. Of his death. They will help you to see. Shed sentimentality. Stop this falling in love with fate. Reside, if you can, in the last place of the dead. Maybe this way. A crush. You pale little boys are crushing him. Your adoring mob of hands and feet, your necks and heads, your nostrils and knees, your still sweet sweat and teeth and grunts, too thick anyway to breathe. How pale his face, his chest, blanket his eyes. Listen now, you can hear the attempt of his breath, that unlost voice calling us from the bottom of the world. The initial comments from early readers were generally positive, some quite enthusiastic, most of the opinions offered in a gentle, tentative manner, suggesting that the question in the room was whether what I'd written might have really happened to me. A woman finally asked if it had. I said no, and a palpable relief spread about the room, soon followed by a hearty new round of criticism. I welcomed it always fascinated by the varying opinions on my work, and thinking, too, that perhaps something in the writing had finally been real enough, that some barrier had been breached. I was pleased by my instructor's comments of, as well, for although he wasn't exactly ecstatic in his praise, he did keep mentioning the character of the prose, its unlikely combination and forms, its insistence and intensity. More than anything else, he told me to keep going, to keep on to persist in my mode, which I have tried to do, to live inside the language, to have faith in its capabilities. I still work word by word, sentence by sentence, with a slow and purposeful improvisation, figuring out character and action by the texture and interplay of the language. To me, words are not so much analogs or representations of being and world as they are the progenitors of being and world. They create the path of action, the path of character. One hopes steadily accruing meaning and change, the forging ultimately of a path of light through the darkness and complexity of the novel to be. In this sense, I think this death scene of my hero's son was more an incantation than a description. Maybe it was the death song I hadn't yet sung for my mother, though even more, I think it was an incantation of a self, which is perhaps what every writer, whether just starting out or in mid-career, must somehow conjure. Uh, thank you very much. I'll stop now. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Lee, for that wonderful, wonderful talk. I know after reading your book that the way in which you speak is so similar to your prose. It's so lyrical and beautiful. So thank you. Um, I am going to lead our Q&A session now. So we have a couple of questions that are already in the Q&A, but if you have any more to ask Professor Lee, please add them and I'll be sure to, to get them answered for you. So starting off with, uh, with a question from Luli. So, Luli asks, what advice would you give high schoolers today who feel obliged to pursue careers in STEM, but who would rather dedicate their time to the study of language and literature? Mm. 
I get that question a lot, Lily, <laughs> especially even from my Stanford students uh, who, you know, Stanford, there, as you, many of you probably know, many of the students there are in STEM. Um, and I know that the, the most popular class is, you know, the intro to computer science <laughs> at Stanford. And uh, which, of course, you know, it just reflects the society and, and where the jobs are and, you know, all those things that are, you know, just about, I guess, you know, financial realities of life. And, and I absolutely, you know, I think, I think we just have to accept that, right? I mean, that's the world is the world. Um, but I must tell you, the, um, the, the, most, uh, the most popular minor at Stanford, and this is after, you know, um, after you know, in, this is taking kids from every discipline, is creative writing, hmm. and and so what that tells me, of course, is that most of the people, yeah, well, I don't know exactly, but but a lot of the people who are doing all these STEM courses, it's not as if they were born wanting to do STEM. <laughs> uh, maybe some of them are, as just born engineers, born mathematicians, born scientists, um, but even those folks. They, they, you know, they, they live in the world. They read books. They, they wanted to create and be creative in different ways, whether it's in, in painting or music or, or, or writing. And, and, and so my feeling has always been um, to, regardless of your situation, and uh, so, many, so many of my Stanford students are from very modest backgrounds. Um, their parents are um, service people. Um, you know, they drive taxi cabs, they run dry cleaners, and, and they made their way into Stanford. And of course, it, in their position, it's very hard for them, particularly sometimes as the first members of their family to, to go to college, to not pursue those jobs at Google and at Goldman Sachs and, at, and all the places where they'll get an immediately solid salary and start their path in a career. Uh, and I always say to them, because a lot of them ask me, you know, I, I always wanted to be a writer, but I just I just can't see how this fits into my life and the realities of my life. And I always say to them, you should honor the realities of your life. I mean, that is that is what we do as children. That's what we do as you know, in fast families. But don't ever let go of your passions. And someday you'll you'll realize whether those passions are strong enough and serious enough and in some ways unavoidable in your, in your heart and in your spirit um, that you'll decide, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do, <laughs> it sounds like, it sounds crazy. I'm not gonna do the easy thing and work for Google, <laughs> but in fact, do the much harder thing and do something in the creative arts, something like literature, something like painting, something like dance. Um, uh, and so that's that's what I tell them is that if if it's strong enough, if it's really there, it will rise up in you and it will push you to do to pursue the things that you're meant to pursue. If it's not, you know, uh, it won't. I mean, I, I I mentioned in my talk that I worked on Wall Street for a year. I was an English major in college. I only studied, you know, Shakespeare, American Lit, Chaucer. Uh, somehow at that time I got a job on Wall Street. I don't know. Someone was crazy enough to give me a job, and uh, and it wasn't a horrible job. It was it was just it just wasn't my perfect cup of tea. I could have probably done it for the rest of my life. But what I did find there was that a lot of my colleagues, and they were older. I was just out of college, and they were you know probably twice my age in their forties. They were all saying, "I'm going to quit soon and write the great American novel." So many of them had other interests, but of course. They didn't quit, <laughs> and again, I, it, it, they didn't quit only because of the money or their, you know, their status in life, but also because, again, I don't think that urge was really there for them. The ones that for whom that urge was there did quit. They did move on to other things. Whether that was actually making art, um, I don't know, but 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 people find their way, and so I just, I guess, I would just say. Try to try to be attentive to your own instincts and to your own urges, especially when those are creative. Um, and whether that means you'll be a, a hobbyist a artist all your life and have a, a, a normal career, or actually pursue it 
uh, 100%, um, uh, you'll find out. That's wonderful advice. Um, I think most of our students here on the call are just starting to explore their passions as, as part of their research projects. And so let Professor Lee be an example to you. Continue to follow those passions. Uh, we have a question from Jin, our, our, one of our co-founders. And she says, thank you for this wonderfully inspiring presentation, Professor Lee. I have a full-time job. She's one of our founders. <laughs> But I've always been interested in trying out creative writing. The problem is that it's so intimidating and I have no idea where to start. Any tips for working adults who want to activate their more creative side? Mm, yeah, well, absolutely. I think one of the first things you should do is maybe uh, you may not have a lot of time, extra time, but to go back and read some of the books, stories or novels that you really loved reading, um, especially you know when when that passion was con uh, was kindled. And what I always say to my students is, go back to those books or stories and and check out the passages or, or sections that you really like, and 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 just write those down. In again, sometimes by hand, sometimes I suggest writing them actually on the computer, just as I did in my talk. You know, at my talk, I, I talked about, you know, needing prose and just needing to keep going. So I would take a passage from one of my heroes and, and, and actually type it on my screen just to just to see it. But actually what happens, I think, is you you begin to understand when you put it on your own screen, the kind of texture, the rhythm and tonality of that work. And it, it can it can kind of thread its way in you when you when you actually type it out yourself. And that will tell you something about what you uh, are stimulated by, what you love in that particular writer. And that might give you a clue to your kind of approach and your kind, of, you know, your voice in, in your own writing. Because I think that's most important is just to figure out what your voice is. And, and then as naturally as possible, without doing too much thinking, without, without trying to take too much advice, just start to tell a story about somebody, whether that's you know a version of yourself, a parent, uh, a friend, or just a completely made up character. Um, just 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 start it in a very very small way. Not try to embrace the whole world. Just write a, just write about someone in a moment, with and and give us lots of specificity. But but I think for those of you who are you know maybe like Jin coming back to it. Uh, I think you have to try to to rekindle what that passion was for for that the, that creative act, and 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 as I say to all my students and everyone who wants to be a writer, no, there's no writer in this world uh, who's ever written anything decent who hasn't been a serious and art art you know um, serious and uh, passionate reader uh, and an attentive reader, um, because that's how we learn how to write you know and. And we writing is something that uh, that um, it it's 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 a mysterious thing because it's not about knowing all the words. You know, there are there are genius kids who have memorized dictionaries at the age of you know whatever, right? At the age of ten or eleven, but that doesn't mean that they can write anything. Uh, it's writing is not just about knowing the story. It's not just about knowing a character. It's not just about knowing the words. It's about having a sense of the world and having a particular angle on it. And, and that is something that we all have because of life, right? Um, so, so I think, Jen, you're, you're well on your way as long as you pay attention to, what, to why you want to begin in the first place. And maybe, that, maybe interrogating those passions will help. Well, I know for a fact that Jen is an avid reader, so I'm sure she is well on her way. Um, speaking of, of, you know, continuing to, to work at writing and, and such, we have a question about um, from an anonymous watcher that says, did you ever think about giving up after the failure of your first first novel? What gave you the motivation to continue? Well, uh, I think I mentioned it is that I was surprised how um, 
calm I was in some in some regard after that rejection. Maybe because I knew the novel was no good, but so so it's just a guy, I guess, acknowledging the truth. But because I was crushed too, right? I mean, I'd spent two years working day and night, not spending as much time with my um, ill mother, um, really feeling like I was making lots of sacrifices. And of course, nobody loves rejection, especially re a, a rejection of something that you've put yourself into and that you're kind of putting all your eggs into that basket. Um, but but what I felt was, was the, a very strange feeling. I just felt like after that rejection, you know, there, there was probably a, a short period of a few days where I was completely devastated and <laughs> couldn't leave my bed. But on 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 kind of getting back on my feet, I realized that I just wanted to try it again. And I and again, I, I didn't feel like it, I didn't feel, you know, I should, certainly didn't feel confident about it. I certainly didn't feel hopeful, but I just wanted to try it again and, and give it another shot. And I think that is the only thing that gave me the motivation and hope and drive and energy to try it again. I think if I hadn't had that feeling, if I think if the feeling had been, oh no, I, I'm just so focused on wanting to be a novelist, I'm just wanting, it wasn't that, it was just, I want to try to, to write a story that people will find worthwhile. A very simple thing and not, not hoping for great fame, not hoping for a career, not hoping for anything, which I think I was, as my talk suggested, I was really focused on before. I was focused on being a writer rather than just writing. And because I always thought, oh, I, I'm, I have enough talent. I'm smart enough. I, I have always written nice sentences. I should be, able, I'm going to be a writer. And, and so, so I think when I was just kind of stripped down to the bare, you know, essentials of what I had, which is just, I like to write. And I wanted to tell a story and focused on that and maybe admitted that to myself. I think that's the thing that just, I don't know if it gave me, it didn't give me any, again, it didn't give me any confidence, but it, it, it gave me just enough energy to try and to make one more attempt. And it probably would have been my last attempt uh, because again, you know, just like the first questioner, I had kind of given myself and my parents, uh, uh, you know, a, a period of a few years to try to make a, uh, to try to make my way into into a, a literary career. Um, so that was my last shot. Well, going back to that follow your passion point, it seems like that really stuck with you and was was also a vehicle for trying again. So yeah. that's wonderful. Um, we have another question from an anonymous watcher who says, thank you so much, Professor Lee, for this excellent talk. If you have the opportunity, can we hear more about ideas for your future work if you have any germinating? Thank you for joining us today. Well, I'm always working on, on uh, some novel, uh, just one at a time. And right now, uh, although I don't love to talk about novels I'm working on too much, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a different novel for me, um, more autobiographical. Uh, you know, people assume that the novels that I've written are auto, some are autobiographical autobiographical but they're not and and this one is a little bit more autobiographical it's it's just at least based upon some of uh, the things that happened and I saw in the places I lived and the kinds of communities I was living in uh, as a child um, uh, you know in New York City soon after we immigrated to to the country and so that's a time that that I always kind of um, that I always kept thinking about and looking back to. And so I finally thought, oh, maybe I'll, I'll, you know, sort of fictionalize that time. And uh, so it's, it's, it's not a memoir, uh, but, um, but it has a lot of me in it. And um, so that's, that's what I'm working on now. Well, keep me posted when it gets published. I'll definitely take it on my next trip. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not your next honeymoon. <laughs> No, definitely not that. <laughs> well, thank you for that preview. <laughs> um, so another question here. It was very interesting to hear even a bit about your literary influences and role models. Are there younger, perhaps lesser known writers now who you'd recommend we turn our attention to? 
Oh, well, there's so many. Um, it's, you know, I, I try to, um, you know, my students sometimes know, know better who those writers are than I do. Um, but um, uh, there, there are a number of writers who, um, you know, they're doing wonderful work. And particularly, I teach a class in Asian American literature and autobiography. And so I can suggest certain um, Asian American writers that I've just been, younger ones that, that, that we've been reading lately. Um, we've been reading works by um, uh, C. Pam Jang. Uh, she has a novel called uh, In These Hills Are Gold. Um, there or the, something like that. I'm, I'm mangling the title. Um, there's a Korean American writer named Aro Kwon, who is a wonderful writer. Um, uh, and one of my uh, former students and who's um, a wonderful writer and, and teacher is uh, Leslie Tenorio, Filipino American writer. Um, and so those are those are some names that uh, that you might want to look into for. Uh, particularly stories of people who are, um, uh, you know, sometimes caught between worlds, uh, mm-hmm. um, and uh, also uh, have have a different perspective on American life. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll definitely add those to my list, as I'm sure many will too on the call. Um, another question for you here. It's a little bit rapid fire, so I apologize. There are a lot of people who want to ask you some questions. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> so Lucy says, what are similarities you see between writing fiction and writing research or more academic papers? Hmm. Well, I think the, the main commonality is probably specificity. Hmm. Um, I think when I teach um, my undergrad courses where, where people aren't, aren't necessarily that um, experienced in writing fiction. Uh, they're all experienced in writing critical essays. And, um, but what happens sometimes when they write fiction is they, they rely on um, generalities. They rely on kind of shared knowledge that we all have, uh, which of course makes sense in, in many ways, but doesn't quicken the heart. <laughs> um, it's always this, the, the particularities of a person in a moment, the particularities of their background, the particularities of what they're thinking. And, and by particularities, I mean just the, the granular notations of self and of world, whether it's external, internal um, narration, external or internal description. Um, that for us make everything seem like it's truly, truly vital and real um, on the page for, 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 for fictions um, or memoir, any creative writing. Um, and that's you know, because if when you're writing critical essays, of course, you need to be very specific with your references, very specific with, you know, just in close reading or close study of, of, of you know, just facts, and and so and, and again, general 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 commentaries in that in that in those essays don't work either, right? I mean, they're they're they, they, you can get you can end up with a general commentary, but only after you know really really granular study of of the issue at hand, and and in fiction, that's trans. You know, the, the way we see that is just through the 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 minute, microscopic, almost detail of 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 life uh, in in any kind of given tableau or or situation, and and I think that's the most important thing: be as specific as possible, and 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 then the next step, of course, is to have that specificity be relevant to the character in the moment. Wonderful advice and definitely appropriate for research papers too, as many of our students know. Yes. Um, (laughs) So another question for you. You mentioned a marathon writing session when you were writing your first, first novel. What is your writing routine like nowadays? And how do you balance writing with your academic duties? Uh, Well, I, you know, when I was writing that first, first novel and early in my career, I would write at all hours and 
you know, <laughs> go out with my friends and come back and <laughs> work. All you nighters. Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a uh, typical kind of New York City life. <laughs> now that I'm uh, old, uh, <laughs> I uh, I wake up, I have my coffee, small breakfast, and I sit at my desk, and I work until I can't, uh, which is probably five or six hours. Uh, on the days I teach, I work a little less, uh, sometimes not at all because I'm so busy. But that's basically my practice. I treat it like a job. And um, and even if I know that I I don't have any you know kind of welling of ideas that morning, I I sit at my desk and and make sure to just give it a try. Um, and people always ask me, you know, do you ever suffer from writer's block? And I and I kind of wondering at that because I say I have writer's block every day. <laughs> I mean, there are very few times when you're not having writer's block. It seems to me. And so, I mean, being a writer is having writer's block all the time. And I think if you accept that, that's when, you know, it, it won't be so burdensome, the idea that you're not constantly, you know, producing language. Um, uh, we, you know, we have this weird idea that writers, you know, have to be productive in a certain way. Um, and maybe that's our capitalist society or maybe it's just the way we are. But, uh, but, but that's not really the case. I think most of the time we just sit here and think. Well, that sounds much more of a sustainable practice than the all-nighters in New York. <laughs> yeah. But um, yes, from, from my experience, especially watching my husband who is a, a PhD student write, it seems like it's a lot, a lot of thinking and planning and um, thinking through ideas. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a question from Keisha. So Keisha asks, thank you so much, Professor Lee. As a lover of literature, I always find inspiration from others when I research and analyze their works. Instead of being a mere appreciator, I hope to become an inspiring creator too. Do you have any advice for literary researchers who want to simultaneously express themselves in their research process? Mm -hmm. You mean in, I, I, I I'm, just to understand the question, in in your research essays or to move towards, uh, you know, if it's if it's obviously moving towards writing fiction, that's one thing. But if it's to um, to try to, um, I guess, bring some of your own creativity, um, and that's very personal. That's very you know idiosyncratic to the work of say, um, literary critical essays, I would actually just, I would say, absolutely. I mean, I think that's where the best uh, literary critics, that's how we identify the best literary critics, the ones who have a, 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 a very personal, um, very a, a unique and idiosyncratic relationship to the material. Um, and that we feel that passion again. You know, I, I had, when I was in college, I had the um, privilege and, and pleasure of working with um, a famous uh, critic, Harold Bloom, uh, who was um, a, a great Shakespeare scholar. And, and in class, I was very shy and, and, you know, I didn't say very much, but I just list, loved listening to him talk about uh, the work. And, and his writing reflected that too. You could tell that it wasn't just, he, was, he wasn't that just that he was trying to figure out something new about the work. He had completely, in some ways, taken in the work inside his cellular structure <laughs> and it made it a part of himself. Um, and in that way, I think he was able to figure out what, what was going on in the pages for him, but also his particular uh, response uh, to, to all that material. Um, so he was an amazing uh, person in the sense that he could recite whole passages from Paradise Lost, Milton's Paradise Lost uh, from memory or, 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 any, or any scene from Shakespeare. But that, was, it was just, that wasn't just a, a parlor trick. He, really, he had really ingrained it into his being. And I think if, if you do that as a literary critic, um, that, that that kind of passion, 
then then it gets expressed in your writing up uh, writing your you know your your essays about it thank you well, we are a little over time, so I want to thank you again, Professor Lee, for your wonderful talk and answering so many of our questions. We're so happy to have you. And for everyone else watching, we hope that you loved this keynote speech, and we encourage you to continue watching our amazing afternoon presenters in the symposium and enjoy the rest of our event and your day. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye. Thanks so much. Bye.